Welcome to worship at Murray Hills Christian Church. We're so glad you're here with us. If you're part of our community, know that we really miss having you here with us. If you're new to this, to this church, to this community, we're so glad that you're here with us today and we look forward to meeting you sometime soon. We're going to share communion a little later in the service, so take a moment now and go get something to drink and something to eat. You may want to have your Bible nearby and a candle lit, but be assured that no matter what, the Word of God is with us, the light of Christ is all around us. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God. Let us pray. God of connection, we enter into our virtual gathering space once again, knowing that we worship together in spirit and in truth. God of peace, we look for signs of your faithfulness, signs of your presence among us. God of comfort, we breathe in deeply, desiring to be drawn closer to you. Refresh and restore us. God of joy, we pray, we sing, and we listen for your voice today and every day. God of love, we lift our voices together, one people united, to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In this time, even when we are separated from one another, we still remember our common calling, God calls us to love and serve others with all our hearts and minds. God calls us to share our gifts of love in all the ways we can. In this time, it has been so wonderful to see all the ways that folks are reaching out to others in every way they can. Let us consider all the gifts that we have to offer as we listen to our invitation music. This is Gabriel Zobo. generosity for the gift of your son Jesus we thank you for calling us to be generous too we ask you to accept every gift we bring to you to bless every gift we give to others we thank you for this opportunity to share with our church with our community with our world we know that even the smallest gift becomes a blessing to others when multiplied by your redeeming grace, and for this we are grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. As we prepare to gather together around the Lord's table, I invite you to 
to take the elements that you have at home that you have prepared for communion, whatever they are, because we know that it doesn't matter that we are not all physically around this table. This table represents God's table. It represents Christ calling us forward as individuals, as community, and as the world, calling us to join in together in love. For all are always welcome at God's table. At this table and on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, do it this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he offered it to them. He said, this is a cup of the new covenant, my promise to you in my blood, that I will be with you always, even through these trying and troubling times, and I will be with you until the close of the age. As often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. The Holy One, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you showed to us the water of life flowing out and over a heart-sick and hungry world. We long to break bread with one another. We long to be together in one place. And you say, come to the table, all of you. Come to the water of life. You give to us the bread of life. And it is your life, the river of life overflowing. You give to us the cup of salvation. And it is your love, the love for all people, overflowing. We are filled with gratitude. We thank you, God, for these holy gifts. In the name of Jesus, amen. called The Land We Love. I don't believe it's too much to have it all. And I don't believe that this is all we have. Maybe someone forgot. Maybe people forgot a lot. Do they fear the sting of the healing sound? I want to live in a country without the wall. I simply doubt that we need that thing at all. When we separate our strength from peace, we weaponize borders and we fear police. Then the land we love will fade behind the wall. I wish it wasn't so hard to see the truth. And I truly see how hard our wishes are. Maybe one of our dreams travels further than what it seems and the way to truth isn't all that very far. I want to live in a country without the hate. I simply doubt that it makes our country great. When we let the labels rule our thought, then we scar the freedom for which our parents fought, and the lands we love will fade behind the hate. And no, I still don't think it's too much for us to ask. Oh, why should any part of the dream be beyond our grasp? Because if hearts can stretch open and minds can stretch open and the future is open too, I want to live in a country without the fear. 
simply doubt that it makes us safer here. When we let the suspicions close our doors And the refugees are broken on our shores And the land we love will fade behind the fear But I know and this is the land where all lives matter And this is the land of justice for a hundred percent this is the land where parties can celebrate our unity, where love is equality, and learning is free, and health is guaranteed because we can. Oh, God above, show me the land we love, and the love will flow throughout. So this is the second week of our four-week Creation Tide series, and our theme for this week is befriending, which isn't a word that we tend to use a lot these days. We do throw around the word friend a lot, though, but I wonder what we mean when we say we want to be someone's friend. From my office, I hear families playing on the playground, and I hear parents asking their children, who is your new friend, when they see them playing with a child they don't know. And then on Facebook, everyone we're connected to, everyone we follow, is called our friend. So are these types of connections what we mean by friendship these days? Is that how we befriend people? Or is there something more to befriending, to becoming someone's friend? So I decided this week to have just a little bit of fun while I was drinking my morning coffee, and I did a Google search for befriending. And I discovered that there are actual befriending organizations in Europe. Organizations that coordinate and support volunteers befriending solitary, elderly, and in-need people. So I decided very happily to follow this rabbit trail of reading as I was drinking my coffee. And can you blame me? I mean, it is harder and harder, at least for me it seems like, to find happy, uplifting things to read. It's a whole lot easier to find things that are sad and frustrating and angering. So, I loved starting my morning with this incredible rabbit trail of reading, and I found some commonalities in the goals of these befriending organizations. So, according to their websites, the role of the befriender is to be there, to lend a helping hand, and to support the other person. There is also the hope that the befriender will create social and emotional bonds with the other person, that their relationship will be a non-judgmental one, that over time creates a commitment between the two people that is mutual and purposeful. So the goals of these befriending organizations isn't just to help and support people, it isn't to just create casual connections, the goal is intentional, deep relationships. That's how they see befriending. And it got me thinking, how many of us, how many of you see yourself on the befriending side of a relationship with God? How many of you see God intentionally reaching out to build to create a mutual, non-judgmental relationship with you, with humanity, throughout all of creation. So, I'm just going to do this while I'm talking. So, this morning's scripture choice for our Creation Tide series were chosen, this is harder than I thought, 
um, to help us see and make the connection of this befriending relationship that God has with humanity. And the scripture that I chose from those choices is from the book of Revelation. Now, I chose the book of Revelation because I love the imagery in it. And because I think the book of Revelation has been given a bad rap in a lot of progressive Christian churches. Now, I believe that Revelation has been given a bad rap because <laughs> I don't believe that the book of Revelation is a story about the end of the world, a story about the second coming of Christ, where most of the world and most of humans get destroyed. I believe that the book of Revelation is another chapter in the story of God's people. That it is full of images, full of metaphors and lessons. And when we read it with that in mind, we see ways that God was and continues to be present in the world with humanity, reaching out. So this morning's scripture is from the last chapter in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, and I'm using the voice translation today. My heavenly guide brought me to the river of pure living waters, shimmering as brilliantly as crystal. It flowed out from the throne of God and of the Lamb, flowing down the middle and dividing the street of the holy city. On each side of the bank of the river stood the tree of life, firmly planted, bearing twelve kinds of fruit and producing its sweet crop every month throughout the year. And its soothing leaves that grew on the tree of life provided precious healing for the nations. No one or nothing will labor under any curse any longer, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will sit prominently in the city. God's servants will continuously serve and worship God. They will be able to look upon God's face and God's name will be written on their foreheads. Darkness will never again fall on this city. They will not require the light of a lamp or of the sun, because the Lord God will be their illumination. By God's light, they will reign throughout the ages. So, when I read this last chapter of the book of Revelation, I can't help but think of one of my seminary professors, um, author Len Sweet, and what he said about apples and oranges, which is why these are here. Um, as he talked to us and peeled an orange, he told us that he believes that a lot of people study the Bible like an orange. We peel off the outer pieces, we pull it apart in sections, peel off little strings, and look at each piece individually, separated and disconnected. And when we look at each segment and string and section separately, we can misinterpret things, and we can miss the connectivity of the whole story. He suggested instead that we approached the Bible like an apple, as one piece that was so connected and enmeshed that there was no part that could be removed, separated, or pulled apart, alpha to omega, beginning to end. It is all one intertwined story. So in the beginning, Sorry, Apple. Very sorry, Apple. You need to be a happy Apple. In Genesis 2, we read that Adam and Eve were not supposed to eat from the tree of knowledge. And we know, of course, that they did, and that their relationship 
humanity's relationship with God was permanently changed. Because of this changed relationship, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, and God put guards at all of the entrances of the garden to keep them and all humans out of the garden, away from the tree of life. Now here at the end, in the book of Revelation, the tree of life is back. This time not hidden away and protected in a garden, but right in the middle of humanity in the city, on both sides of a divided street. No one denied access ever again. So these two passages are the bookends of tree imagery that's used throughout the Bible, illustrating God being present with, providing for, reaching out, and befriending humanity. Here are a few examples, starting at the beginning, working our way through. At the end of the flood, it is the branch of an olive tree that lets no one know that the flood is over. God letting him know that it's time for humanity to begin to heal and to move forward. In Exodus, after Moses leads the people out of oppression and slavery, they find rest when they come to Elam, where there are 12 springs and 70 palm trees where God cares for them. One of my favorites is from the 41st chapter of Isaiah. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, so that all may see and know. God desiring that all people know that God is present in many different forms. Ezekiel uses almost the exact same imagery as we find in this passage of Revelation. On the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water that flows from them is from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. When Jonah is at the end of his journey, God provides a tree and shade for him. God trying to support Jonah on his faith journey. The images at the beginning of the Gospels of Matthew, the lineage at the beginning of Matthew and Luke, draw the reader to connect with the Isaiah passage that Sandy preached on last week about the branch from the stump of Jesse, tree imagery to help people see and understand who Jesus was, God present in the flesh. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus uses tree imagery to describe God's kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it has grown into the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air may make their nest in the branches. God supporting and caring for all of creation. Zacchaeus climbs a tree to see and gain access to Jesus. God providing a way for Zacchaeus to find his way. In the Gospel of John, Jesus uses tree imagery to describe his own relationship with God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. The final Passover week began with people cutting off branches from trees and waving them and laying them before Jesus, declaring that he was their Messiah. Jesus dies on the cross made of trees. The cross continues to be the most important symbol for us Christians today. And even Paul, in a letter to the Romans, uses this tree imagery to describe and explain how Gentiles become part of 
this originally Jewish faith with Jesus as the Messiah. These are just a few of the over 200 images of trees used in the Bible between the first one of, in creation of the tree of life and this last one in Revelation of the tree of life. You can go hunting this week and find more if you would like. And we know that we could look at each one of them separately, an individual string, an individual segment, and we could get different meanings from each and every one of them. And we can look at them like we look at an apple as one whole piece and see the bigger image, the bigger message. God, present in creation, present with humanity, from beginning to end, reaching out, befriending humanity. And we know that the Bible isn't the end of the story. God continues to be present. God continues to reach out to befriend humanity. And trees continue to be a sign if we look, if we see. And we are so lucky here in Oregon because we are surrounded by trees. Right now, I can look out the sanctuary doors and out through the library windows, and I can see multiple trees. I can see tall, unchanging evergreen trees that have been here long before any of us. And I can see newer, smaller, younger trees that change with the seasons, all reminding me that God is here, surrounding us, and providing for us in both new and in unchanging ways. Every week, every day, every day, Catherine and I go for walks through our neighborhood. It is one of the really good things that has happened and has changed in this weird new normal that we're living in. And as we go on our walks, I find myself looking at the trees. Over this last six weeks, I have, we have watched the trees change. They've gone from these bare stick-like figures to being covered in small green buds, to exploding with green leaves and small flowers. And I find myself being comforted. It's as if every bud, every exploding leaf, every exploding flower is God talking. God reminding me that during these uncertain times, God is there providing signs of hope. Hope that this current way that we are living is not forever. Hope that new life will emerge again. And I wonder if there are trees around your house and on your walks that give you comfort, that remind you of God's presence in your life in these times. If so, I'd love to see them. I invite you to send them in, whether it's through email, through text, or even printing off the picture and sticking it in, the, in snail mail and getting it to the church. Because I wonder if we share these images of trees, these symbols of God's presence with us, God reaching out into humanity, we can remind each other of the hope that is there, the hope that exists. Maybe, maybe we can, as we journey together down this road that's full of twists and turns and we can't see around the corner, maybe we can provide hope and reassurance for each other that our new normal, our new life together is just around one of those tree-shaded corners. Amen. We come to our prayer time now. We have some prayers that have been offered up on behalf of the church, and I'll light a candle as we pray each name. We have prayer, we ask, we have, 
We need healing and comfort, prayers of healing and comfort for Martha, Cy, Martha and Sai and their son Mark and his wife. For Judy Menigan, safely home, and also for her son Jeff, who remained in Hawaii, and for her uh, son and all her family on the loss of their father Larry. Pray for Wilma Cribs and for Dora. Pray for those who are alone and without hope, those who are searching for meaning and purpose, for those who long to know your amazing grace. God, we ask that you give us the courage to work together in all the ways that we can so that your justice will be done, so that your loving kindness will guide us now into a future where we share life as one people in one very small world. O oh, healing river, we pray that you will pour down your waters and heal your people. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the source of living water. Amen. And our, and are we singing now? I think so. Yes, we're singing Amazing Grace. I forgot. Okay, we will end with Let's Amazing do it. Grace. Let's do it. And thank you to Darlene Robinson for leading us to it today. Thank you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that's 
close in prayer. Eternal God, Alpha and Omega, our beginning and our end, as we head into the week ahead, may challenges not overwhelm us, may circumstances not discourage us, may we remember that you are with us, help us be aware of the signs of your presence with us and among us providing hope, providing comfort, providing strength, and providing joy each and every day. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. 